Welcome back to Fresh Outlook. Two years ago, Superstorm Sandy walloped the east coast of the United States. Two years later, many areas are still hurting. Take a look. This year, October was calm and mild through the Northeast, a sharp contrast to the brutal weather which slammed the coast two years ago. Hurricane Sandy tore through the greater New York, New Jersey metroplex, destroying much of the coastal communities. Lives were lost, businesses, tourist attractions, and residential areas wiped from the strong storm. Subway systems were flooded and crippled. A fire burned down a Rockaway community. Staten Island became a borough of debris, and the Jersey Shore, a major revenue port for the state, crippled. Afterwards, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie launched a slickly produced ad campaign stronger than the storm, hyping New Jersey's resilience. Within weeks, much of the inland area saw power restored, gasoline supplies brought back online, and returning to normal. But along the hardest hit coastal communities, the damage was greater. In the two years since, much rebuilding to new, more stringent building codes was seen, but not for everyone. Many homeowners still hold the keys to hulking ruins, unable to secure funding to rebuild. Throughout the storm-ravaged areas, today, hundreds of homes remain abandoned, and homeowners have abandoned hope of finding financial aid to help them and are rebuilding on their own. This week, Governor Chris Christie was challenged during a press conference. So listen, you want to have the conversation later? I'm happy to have it, buddy. But until that time, sit down and shut up. So what lessons were learned from Sandy? Are the channels of recovery funding set up for optimal results? What are the environmental impacts of the cleanup? And how can storm-prone areas better themselves for another storm? We are back on set now with Fresh Outlook to discuss more about Superstorm Sandy. I'm joined by Andrew Winston, CEO of Winston Eco Strategies and author of the book, The Big Pivot. Armand Lembo, president of Lemcor Incorporated and Judith Stark, who is the executive, co-director rather, of environmental studies at Seton Hall University and a professor of philosophy. Let me begin by asking you, Andrew, um, what's your checkup on Superstorm Sandy two years later. It seems like there still needs to be a lot of rebuilding and a lot of lessons to be learned. Yeah, I mean, I, I come at it from the business perspective, or what does this mean for the business community? And, and business was hit very hard, obviously, by the storm. And I think there's been a lot of reaction in, in the cities and in the business community to try to become more resilient, to try to get your, your business ready for the extremes. Uh, but there's kind of a larger point about whether a resilience is enough, you know, whether getting ready for a storm is enough. We need to also kind of acknowledge that these storms are going to get more frequent with climate change and try to do something about climate change. But that's well. always a problem with right. government and municipalities right. is that we only have the short-term fix. We don't have the long-term solution because politically that's not viable often or so it right. seems. Judith, what's your take two years after Superstorm Sandy? Well, because so much of the thinking is short-term, that's why I think we need much more long-term conversations about what should, what, what should be done. Mm -hmm. And as far as I can see, there aren't many venues within which those conversations are taking place. So what I see as an educator is that it's really important to encourage my students not just to be thinking about the long, the short term, which of course needs to be done to some extent, but really what are these long-term issues that we should be dealing with with an area that is so vulnerable as the Jersey Shore is. These are barrier islands. Many of these barrier islands have very low elevation, if at all. And the really larger question is to what extent should they be rebuilt. I know that's not a popular question, but I think it's a question that needs to be raised. All right, we will raise that question in just a minute. Let's first get Armin's uh, take on Superstorm Standy two years later. You were very active and involved with your company and the cleanup, correct? Tell me a little bit about that. It, it was, um, it, you don't normally think of yourself as a first responder in the garbage business, but we were turned into first responders because of the amount of debris. We had seen storms before. We'd had Irene the year before. This was of a magnitude that none of us um, could imagine. Fortunately, at LEMCOR, we were prepared and able to uh, get up and running without power quickly and start moving debris uh, almost a day after the storm. And if you don't remove that debris right away, it becomes a health hazard. Big time. Yeah. And that was uh, mm -hmm. one of the things that I've, I've tried to explain to people about this debris is that there were two segments of debris. The first responsibility was to get the, the regular household garbage off the streets, which presents a big health issue. And then the second wave of debris was the actual storm debris. All right. 
Winston, was this the storm of the century? <laughs> are we going to see more storms of the century like this? Has this just become a uh, phrase that people are throwing around and it's just become the new norm? Yeah, well, I think Governor Cuomo had the kind of quote of the storm when he said, I've had, I've had um, 200 year storms in three years. Right. So mm -hmm. I, I think the idea that the, the standards we've seen in the past about what's a 100 year storm or a 50 year drought or whatever the extreme is, they're clearly mm -hmm. changing. And I, and I think people can, can say they don't believe in climate change. And you don't, or don't believe that humans are the cause, but, but to deny that the actual weather is changing in the extremity of it, the, the harshness of the storms, the, the, you know, the, the depth of the floods, the length of the droughts, these are all getting worse, right? right? So this means we as citizens and as businesses have to be prepared for a different level of extremes that are coming at us. We'll talk to you about that preparedness in just a second. Let me talk to Judith a little bit about the storm of the century. Mm -hmm. was. Superstorm Sandy, the storm of the century, or is this just the part from, of the problem? From anything that I read, and you know, it's so hard to predict, but clearly, as one of the important factors of climate change, there'll be more storms, more powerful storms, more droughts. So we really need to be thinking long term and, and really relatively short term about the kinds of resilience that we want. And it's not enough to just use the rhetoric to say stronger than the storm because nature is so powerful. But how about being smarter than the storm? <laughs> okay. I, th I think that's really the way yeah. to do. And we're gonna get some of those strategies in just a second. Now, Armand, in this battle, you are really hands-on. So how long have you had LEMCOR? Uh, I've owned LEMCOR for uh, eight years, at its, I'm sorry, 10 years at its present location. About 10 years. Yeah. In the 10 years, have you seen anything even close to Superstorm Sandy? Not even close, yeah, not even close. Irene scratched the surface, uh, we saw heavy debris for two, three weeks, this was, you know, right through the new year. This was, this was the real thing. Have you changed your protocol going forward, knowing that you're going to perhaps encounter more storms like this? We have, we were, we were very prepared. We, we had a lot more uh, stuff in place than other facilities did as far as being able to generate power and operate temporary lighting and things like that, and two weeks worth of fuel storage. But we've built in a lot more things for things that we didn't um, think of. In other words, the anxiety of our employees having to leave their loved ones. It's great to be able to run your facility, but if you can't get your staff there, how do you do that? So we're a little more organized in how we would get people to work and back from work. Um, we've looked at uh, some alternative power stuff that we're, we're starting to explore through some of our engineering consultants and things like that. Sounds good. I'm going to stop you this there. Uh, Judith, tell mm -hmm. me a little bit about the phrase stronger from the, than the storm. We heard that time mm -hmm. and time again. I almost feel it was a political ad for Chris Christie. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, tell me yeah. about your disdain or uh, <laughs> approval well, of that slogan. I think there's a bit of hubris or arrogance in using a phrase like that because nature is just so powerful. You know, we just can't be stronger than it. But we might be able to be smarter. How do we smarter. become smarter? Okay. Um, there are about 15 or 16 environmental organizations in the state of New Jersey who have put together a two-page report that is just fantastic. And the report is called uh, New Jersey Stronger, I'm, I'm sorry, Smarter and a Better Future. So looking at some of those principles that they have there, knowledge, uh, resiliency, thinking about uh, long term, not simply short term, the economic implications. These are some of the guiding principles that we need to be, and, and also having robust public conversations, not simply shouting matches, which may be great performance, right. but they really don't advance the public, kind of serious public discourse that we need to have that's really respectful of other people's points of view and respectful of the persons. Andrew, you've given this a lot of thought. You've put it in your book, at least in part, in The Big Pivot. Tell me, three things that governments, business, people should be doing to be smarter and stronger than the storm? Well, I, I think the main thing is to actually look at your sources of energy. I think one of the things Armand has talked about is how ready they were for the storm, in part because they had all these generators. But you've also talked about um, having to have your um, workers go and carry you know, canisters to go get diesel. If I recall after the storm, the, the um, the gas stations ran out, right? Yeah, that was so, the, the biggest right. part of the so nightmare. The number one found. thing is actually to look at your energy use. And so there's a couple attributes of that. But the main thing is, is to really take a hard look at renewable energy. There are a lot of companies around the country now using renewable energy in massive quantities, putting solar on the roof, using fuel cells in their buildings, so that they can be disconnected 
from the grid if they need to be. So Who are the leaders in this area? Well, be, you'd be surprised, but the largest mm. buyer of renewable power in the country is Walmart, besides the military. Actually, the military is doing more mm. than anybody, and, and a lot of people don't realize this because they are very strategic about these things. They see climate change and weather as a strategic threat, right. and they want to be independent of fuel sources that they can't control. Right. And the sun and the wind and geothermal, and you know, these are, these are sources that we know are coming every day. The sun comes up every right. day. So there's, and the economics have gotten so much better so quickly that a lot of people don't realize how cheap it's mm -hmm. become. Well, incrementally it's happening anyway. Yeah. More people are driving hybrids, right. people are driving mm -hmm. plug-ins, people are having solar panels put yeah. on their homes. So right. maybe the change is happening, but it's just mm -hmm. not happening rapidly so we don't notice? It's not as fast as, as we probably need, right? Not only just to build resilience, but also to, to try to avoid some of the biggest problems of the future. I mean, the real question is, are we going to limit the damage of climate change? Are we gonna make it so that we're not seeing a Hurricane Sandy every few years, so that we're actually, re, you know, do we have that control it. though? I mean, because there's so many non-believers yeah. out there right. who say man has, if any, only minimal impact right. on the environment, mm -hmm. and that we've had changes in our environment right. and climate for years. Right. And in fact, this was the coldest winter ever. So why are you calling it global warming? Right. We hear these right. things all the you time. You hear it all the time, but it's it's remarkably uninformed, to be honest with you, because we had the coldest winter in a long time in this region, right? In about 1% of the global mm -hmm. surface of the right. planet. The rest of the planet had yes. the hottest last 12 months in history. Right. So we've continued to warm aggressively around the world, but of course there are cold spots and sometimes it's cold during what we call winter, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's not a shock. Right. It mm -hmm. just gets colder during winter. Sometimes it's a colder winter, but broadly speaking, temperatures are rising and weather's getting more extreme. Mm -hmm. I'm not a scientist. That's the, that's right. the common refrain now. Right. I'm not yeah. a scientist. Right. I'm not either, but I actually trust them. Mm -hmm. When my doctor tells me I have cancer, I don't say I'm a cancer skeptic, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. I say, okay, let's, let's figure out what we need to do to avoid this and to manage the problem. Mm -hmm. Judith, why are there so many non-believers out there in climate change? You know, just the phrase, I don't believe in climate change, of course, I think it is happening. But the, the way that phrase gets used makes it sound as though we're talking about little people somehow. But, you know, but, it, is, it, but it is, but it is part of it's politics, because oh, you generally have the right saying that this is hokum yes. and that it's a way to restrain business. Right. Right. And you have the left saying right. that we need to give trillions of dollars right. to uh, Senator X's right. yep. uh, environmental right. But it's good for business. But, That's yeah. the main story. Yeah, right? exactly. It is good for business to go down this path. So That's the story. That can, is the story, but a right. lot of environmental firms have not been viable that have been given X number of dollars mm -hmm. through public funding, correct? Well, a very small, narrow band of clean economy or clean tech companies that have gotten some money have failed, but a very large number have succeeded much more if, than Judith, what's your take on that? If we can, we if we can separate out the left and the right battle yeah. for a moment and just say, you know, let's look at the science of it. We need better scientific literacy among our population so they can look at something like the, the National Climate Assessment that just mm -hmm. came out all reputable scientists, virtually 99% of the climatologists and meteorologists around the world know that climate change is happening. Climate change is happening and it's man's fault or people's fault? Yes, because of the burning of fossil fuels. Yes. That is the, and methane, you know, those two gases in particular, the CO2 and the methane, this is what is creating climate change. Armin, let me get your take on all of this. What, did, what is your take on climate change, man's role, people's role, that type of thing? I, you know, I'm, I'm not an environmentalist, but to what Andrew said, one thing that is that did um, really resonate with me is that, you know, because I was prepared and I was had some sustainable things there that I could use my own way to generate power and be up and running, I was open and in business, which is good for business. Right. A lot of yes. other people in my line of work weren't open, right? which isn't good for business. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this was... Uh, a big event for our industry that we needed to respond to and to and not if you're be off able the to grid. respond. If you're off the grid, you're out of the, the game. Right. Okay. What do we do moving forward? Just have a few moments left. Well, the, the very big picture is to, is to shift how we use energy, right? That's, that's the big story. But the way to do that is in part business making those choices, but also we do need policy. We need government. I'm not, you know, I'm not a policy guy, but we need a price on carbon. That's being discussed mm -hmm. for the first time in years at a national level a price in this or country. tax on carbon well, doesn't matter what you call it right. there's there's mm -hmm. a lot of ways to do it where it doesn't cost mm -hmm. people much or anything at all mm -hmm. you tax carbon the thing you don't want and you give money back to people directly and so the people actually at the bottom of the scale do better under a, a tax rebate program and that's what other countries have done and it works really well let's get judith in on this what's your final thought about how final we thought, move forward robust careful informed public conversations at every level from the grassroots, local organizations, local citizens, regional, 
good regional public transportation, and the state level. They were all, we are all stakeholders in this. And I think the younger generation is invested it in is. this, and they are part of the dialogue as well. Let me thank my guests right now. We were joined today by Armin Lembo, who is the president of LEMCOR, Andrew Winston, who is the author of the soon-to-be bestseller book, The Big Pivot, as well as Judith Stark, who is a professor extraordinaire at Seton Hall University. <laughs> Thanks so much for all of your comments and thoughts today. When we come back, Ebola is back in the headlines. This time, a nurse from Maine strikes us to find tone. More after this.